While they are departing, will you pray with me? Gracious God, we have read from your word, we have sung your praises, we have offered our prayers. Now we seek to interpret your word. Be with us, guide us, help us, and protect us. That the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together will be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. He's right here. <laughs> that's that's going to play well on tape. You, you can edit that part out if you want to. Um, finish this quiz. Or I should say pop quiz. Because you've had the material. Um, perhaps Joy don't answer right away since you actually read it. <coughs> finish this line. The love of money is... I heard, I heard one right answer somewhere in this zone. Was that you? Oh, probably, probably. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not all evil. All kinds of evil. And that's a really common, you know, that's like a 98% chance that I'm going to get the answer I expected when I do that. It's, that was not high risk. I knew what you were going to answer because it's become a part of the vernacular that is among that list of things that we think are in the Bible, but we don't necessarily have them right. Um, where's Beth? Is she in the room? Yeah, she's in today. Um, Beth, Beth got to witness me a couple of weeks ago unpacking a lot of things that were not necessarily in the Bible when her neighbor, uh, she asked me to go visit a neighbor that was in uh, a care center. Um, and, and, and it was fun watching Beth's eyes because she knew most of it, and I was very proud of you. Uh, I haven't said that. But, and, and the neighbor, her eyes were just getting great big like saucers. What do you mean that's not it? Yes, it is. I'm like, no, it's really not in the Bible, but... Um, uh, you know, and, and, and I don't want to get caught in those illustrations because the point here is this, this quote we have it has become a little bit of a throwaway because honestly, both of these scripture texts we don't really want to deal with as first world citizens um, in, in a world that is so poor, right? Bill read for us the story of the rich man and Lazarus that basically implies, if we're not careful, that um, Lazarus is getting blessed, and, and don't get too confused with Lazarus of this story and Lazarus of the miracle of John. <coughs> Remember, they're different Gospels. Um, Lazarus um, enjoying the riches of heaven because of being poor on earth, and the rich man being sentenced to, I believe the literal translation word used in, in the text Bill, uh, Bill read was Hades, buried in Hades, no less, um, because of the riches they experienced. We, we don't love hearing that, knowing where we stand relative to the world. We don't love being told by Paul that riches amount to essentially damnation. I can't imagine why you don't like hearing that. <clears throat> but Paul is really trying to get at a bigger point, and I would argue Jesus in the parable is too. We talked a little bit about the parable, the story of the rich man and Lazarus last week. Let me, let me retouch that for just a moment. That Jesus was telling a series of stories, remember this? About the nature of wealth. And specifically, loving money more than God. Which is what Paul's trying to do too. So apparently, for at least a couple of thousand years, this has been a problem for people. This has been a challenge. Now, 
I know it's not a challenge for y'all, but you may encounter somebody this week that needs to hear this by translation from you. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about it, even though I know you don't definitively need to hear this message. Um, what Paul is telling us, though, is, well, as the title says, learn to be content. Learn to understand that God gives me enough. Enough not only to provide for my needs, but to be able to share, to be generous, to be giving. It always seems like it's never enough though, right? There's always one more bill, one more ask, one more something to do, one more just when I thought I was going to get completely out of debt and things were going to get normal, a car breaks, uh, a, a, a unexpected bill comes in, there's a hole in the roof, whatever it is, it never seems to be enough. We get excited when we get raises or new jobs or new opportunities and then suddenly a bill that more than offset it seems to come in. And we fight with these texts that imply that, and these aren't standalones, right? That relative to the world, for the rich it is hard to enter the kingdom of heaven. We have that camel through the eye of a needle thing. We have this, uh, these two, they go on and on. And in our world of relative affluence, where most of us drove to church in cars that we didn't worry if they were going to start and didn't have to plan or walk or ride our mule or whatever the case may be. I said walk, so I, I think I covered that one. Um, I almost said ride our bikes, but then I realized that that happens sometimes. But it's a choice. It's a choice. <laughs> Versus a forced situation. And what Paul is challenging us with. Is a willingness to live in the mode of enough. I can't remember. I suspect I've told you the story of the rich man who dies and went to heaven. Um, uh, who was an exceptional negotiator. And he was very concerned about. Not only preserving this wealth, but beating the phrase, you can't take it with you. Now, Paul has repeated this phrase in his own way earlier in the text. Remember where he said, we are born with nothing and we go and we die with nothing. But um, this particular man um, got together with God and negotiated and, uh, and, and fought and haggled. And finally, um, um, God agreed, fine. You can convert your wealth to gold bricks and bring them with you. So he shows up at the gates of heaven. and He, he meets not Father Abraham, but St. Peter. <laughs> See what I did there with the text? <laughs> and um, and, and St. Peter said, well, this is unusual. What do you got there? I've got my cases. Well, nobody comes with cases. What do you got there? And he said, well, let me show you. And he opens them up and he says, you brought paving stones? <laughs> because the conversion of that which we have on this earth is pointless in the kingdom of heaven once again we find ourselves yes playing a little bit with the humor aspect of it all realizing that what we store up on earth for heaven has to be stored up in generosity in care for others in genuine love in support in mutual affection in, well, the gifts of the Spirit. And the problem is, those investments don't always pay, right? Not only do you not feel like you get paid back monetarily, but sometimes the investment of love and concern and care and support not only gets taken begrudgingly, but often just taken and you feel ignored. There is no reciprocity. Right? How often have we reached out in love to feel like we got not even a fairly gracious thank you back? 
Maybe I'm the only one that experienced that. I don't see a lot of nods. There we go. Okay. Because if you don't agree, i got a problem with what I'm doing next in this sermon, and that's an issue. It happens. And it frustrates us, and it eats at our spirit and our soul. I give, I work, I strive, I, 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 I want to make a difference, I want to be positive, and take without even a thank you. And Paul is reminding us to be content even in those moments because your thank you notes are being stacked up in what is to come. Over the 25 plus years of my ministry, I hear people from time to time talk to me about, well, I tithe. It doesn't necessarily all go to church, but I give. And I'm like, great. Great, I'm fine with that. Because I'm not a big fan of, listen to this whole thing carefully. Listen to the whole thought, I may repeat it. I'm not a big fan of worrying about tithing. I'm not a big fan about worrying about tithing because that's an Old Testament standard that Jesus said you bring your tithes and your offerings, which is to imply more than 10%. What keeps me up at night as your pastor is, and I know, to use the old phrase, I'm preaching to the choir here, <coughs> how do we move from worrying about tithing to worrying about generosity? Does generosity set a specific number standard? Or does generosity respond with love in whatever way I'm able? Does generosity say, I gave you 10 minutes of my time. <laughs> That's 10% of 100 minutes. I'm sorry, you're going to have to come back after another 90 minutes. And then we'll see about whether or not I have more time to give you. Is that how generosity works? No. Generosity says, and I am horrible at this, but I try, I really honestly try, that for the moments, now I'm picking on you because you were the right pair of eyes at the right moment, for the moments I'm with you, you are the most important person on the planet. And when we have completed what we need to, that next person will be the most important. And we strive to continue to be in connection to people, meeting needs, connecting hearts, living out of the richness of the grace we've experienced through Jesus Christ. Christians, we are called to be generous. That's what Paul's really telling us. Your life has been changed. You have received the promise of eternal blessing. That's done. You got it. You won. You're winning. winning. Yay! <laughs> we! Exactly. You are already winning. The outcome is sealed. It is guaranteed. Imagine all those interactions that frustrate you when you know and really believe that now you're just stacking up the glory of your win. Wow. Be content with what God's given you and be willing to share. Be gracious, be generous because what God is continuing to give you well, that's some awesome stuff. And that's a lock. That's already guaranteed. Live like you believe it. Every day. <coughs> With everyone. And watch that sense of blessing multiply. I promise you, it happens.
May God make it so this week in your life. Amen.